Sam Bird ultimately went through a divorce with Jaguar and Mitch Evans, and then had the balls to just show up and snatch away Mitch Evans' first potential win for this whole season. You don't want to break the rules. You don't want to be like the gun and get a 40 place grid penalty for swapping out some parts. But there's no rules pertaining to artificial intelligence operating your car. You think we might be the sole source of media coverage for ERT at this point. Ooh, fourth fastest in FP1, Danny! Free practice without a doubt is ERT's EPRI. Get him some grass stain new balances and we have ourselves Formula E's from your daddy. One thing you notice about this Floatium is it is being driven by the feet. <laughs> of yeah. these race volunteers. <laughs> wow, in Wolverhampton and in Bromsgrove. <laughs> what did he say? It feels like sometimes we don't even have to write the cockney into this man. This is the epitome of, of how you win a race in Formula E. You edge all race long. You don't let it bust, not yet. And then on the final lap, you stroke that thing until you bring it home and you get the race win. <laughs> Good evening. Tonight, we are in Sao Paulo, Brazil, as we delve into the electrifying world of Formula E, the pinnacle of EV racing. High-performance cars race through city streets powered solely by taxpayer electricity. But is this eco-friendly spectacle truly the future of motorsport, or just another attempt of socialist virtue signaling, trying to turn motorsport into a traveling bisexual circus. Buckle up, because we're about to separate the hype from the reality, right here on Circuit Breakers. Welcome back to Circuit Breakers. My name is Dallas, joined with me, as always, Taylor. How are you doing post Sao Paulo? Oh my God, man, what a wonderful Sao Paulo Ypres. I feel like, um, you know, we've moved back to that Peloton style racing that everyone complains about. And I have to sit here and be like, bring me more. I love that chaos that's on track. Now, do you think people are complaining about the final lap of this race, which we will get to in greater detail with Sam Bird, the divorced dad, just pulling one out? Dallas, I felt like I was high. Uh, I, I like after watching that overtake, I was like, "This is one of the best final three turns in motorsports I've ever seen." I felt like I like got out of my car. I had to go. To, I had to like go into work, uh, and I was like high. I was trying to tell people about it. And they're like, "Okay, dude, whatever." Like it's like you don't understand what I just saw. It was amazing. Just all juiced up. You'd be like, "Bird, papaya." Yeah, papaya. exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, the papayas yeah, are those, here. They showed up. Uh, wow. More than anything, I think the Nissan powertrain uh, uh, made a very, very uh, promising appearance for people that maybe had doubt that it was going to be a two horse race uh, between the Porsches and the Jaguars. And we have been proven wrong. Uh, there is a very competitive grid uh, minus the Mahindra power unit and ERT. <laughs> well, they'll still get tons of love here on this show, but we'll get to the nitty gritty of the race. But first we need to talk about this disgustingly long gap that we had to deal with. Last race was in Deria at the end of January. It is now mid-March and we get the next round in the world championship. Oh man, it, uh, it's impressive because I've had friends that have literally gone through their whole winter quarter by between the time in which the last race and now happened. Uh, to put it into perspective, like F1's summer break is like 12 days shorter than what we just experienced. <laughs> uh, the, the gap between the final race of Formula One's season to their preseason testing it was almost the same as this. Yeah, and this is a common theme in Formula E. This isn't a one-off, it's a weird season. This COVID's not going on anymore. 
So for whatever reason, between like rounds two and four or five, there's always this big stupid gap. To put it by the numbers, this gap is the longest since season seven with Mexico City in round three to Rome. That was 56 days. And it's aside from COVID, it's I'm going to take that back again. Um, this gap between Diria and Sao Paulo is the longest stint since season seven. And that was between round three in Mexico City and round four and five in Rome. That's 56 days. And at least we got a double header in Rome with those two rounds. But this is a, a constant with Formula E. They start out the gate in the new year. They're like the first racing league to get going. And they're like, OK, we got like two or three in. Let's uh. Let's coast a little bit. Let's conserve some energy. It's like, what are we doing here? Well, so what it is, is that um, the uh, race in Hyderabad, um, the Indian race, uh, got canceled. So uh, there was a race uh, between that gap. um, But uh, the city of Hyderabad got new elected government and they canceled the race because last year it caused some minor traffic. But um, they have when, when you cancel a race, you have to pay like a huge cancellation fee. Mm-hmm. So essentially what they did was that they canceled this race and they paid essentially for the race to happen without the race happening. And what that does is that means that you don't make any money from the race happening. Like you just you just threw money away and you cause this kind of like a uh, scar on uh, on the notoriety of like what can be held in your city. It's it's bizarre to me, and you know, if you had just said let's run it and then we won't come back next year, that's one that's that seemed like the more realistic odds. But it seemed like a campaign that they were leading on was to shut this race down, and they did it, and it was successful for them. But yeah, kind of a gross gross outcome, and it caused a very long gap for yes, us to it endure. Did. Yeah, I'm sure the uh, the taxpayers are stoked on that decision as well. Fans or not having an event in your city canceled. I think uh, this is a good time to uh, remind returning viewers and listeners and informing new ones uh, that our, our divide in race knowledge experience. I'm still a newbie. I didn't even catch that one. I didn't know there was a Hyderabad race that was going to happen and then it wasn't. But Taylor, that's one of the reasons why you're here to fill me in and the, the other people that are like, it's such a long gap. What would what, what happen? And I'm, that's why. Now, during this gap, uh, we had plenty of time to catch up with these drivers and what they were up to, mainly with just getting back into the swing of electric racing. And so browsing Twitter uh, leading up to the race and just seeing, I didn't realize uh, until I started going on Twitter on the uh, the Circuit Breakers Twitter account that is uh, the plug here, it's Talk Formula E. I just search Circuit Breakers on Twitter if you're on Twitter. Anyways, um, some incredible images of the drivers give us some insight. We're going to start with Ido. Go! Both the Mahindra drivers, Ido Mortara and Nick DeVries, Nick DeTeeth, as uh, we're going to push that that namesake. Uh, someone in Mahindra is like, hey, throw in a bow tie, serve some cocktails, uh, and that's what we get. <laughs> so... <laughs> It, this this is one of the reasons why I love Formula E. I've said it before that, that Formula E is my first motorsport love, so it's you know it's locked in. But you don't see this in other sports, at least in my experience, where you tell your your star players, which are only two per team, hey, go throw on a bow tie and your your team shirt and go serve some drinks. And okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, I. I'm actually very thankful you didn't give us the Nick DeVries version of that uh, <laughs> because Edo looks like he's having the time of his life. And the only thing I can imagine is Nick DeVries just chewing on the cocktail shaker. Um, <laughs> like he's using his I mouth did, for the shaking did. that thing. He's like a dog. He's like a dog with a plastic fucking toy just shaking the hell out of it. You have left me and listeners in too much intrigue to not pull it up now. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, we got to make it happen now. I need to, I need to show it. I need uh, to share it, this yeah. with the world. 
Bada bing, bada boom. There we go. Oh, there it is. Wow. So he's yeah, he's you versus his... the guy she tells you not to worry about. <laughs> Do you think then, like right when this picture was taken, he's looking over with that big old Nick DeVries smile, uh, not because he's happy he's wearing a bow tie. <laughs> he's got a fresh yeah. pile of tires off screen. He's got a fresh pile of tires, on. and whoever is sitting off screen is telling him, Nick, don't chew on that. And he's tightening it like, I'm going to chew on it. I'm going to chew on it. I'm going to chew. You you, you told me not to chew, but you can't keep me from chewing. (laughs) Well, there you have it. Both Ito and Nick DeVries uh, wearing the bow ties for Mahindra. I do want to take a second because we talked about it in a previous episode of how we got Ito on Cameo to give kind of a post- season recap for our fantasy formula e-league i pulled up ito's cameo and you know how if you browse cameo you can see the recent cameos they've done since that cameo there's only been one other person that has had a cameo done by ito mortara so shameless plug to the man it's 20 bucks Ito Have him is say a, whatever is you an want. Angel. The man's an angel. Flip back over to that picture of him shaking. Look at this. Look at this angel. He is he is one of the I think the kindest and most like sincere racing drivers you can find. How could you how could you not want a little birthday wish from Ito? Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. There's only one other Formula E driver on the cameo lineup, and it is Stoffel, the Waffle Man, Van Dorn, and he is much more expensive. But we're not talking about Stoffel, we're talking about Ollie, the dad, Oliver Roland, uh, taking a picture with uh, with his son, or son in team, uh, Sasha Fenestrand. Yeah, Daddy Roland, man. I love the fact that Oliver Rowland has been on podium the last two races because we get more of him. And when you had originally said it, this might be uh, in the grid preview episode that doesn't exist. We'll talk about that at the end of the show. Uh, But you pointed out Oliver Rowland just like this dad figure. And you said it and I looked up a picture. I'm like, oh, okay. But after hearing that and getting more information and kind of digesting it, I'm like, this guy totally is a dad and so here's a little snapshot uh before the sao paulo e pre and then uh, you had requested this when we we're going through our notes to get uh daddy roland in his dad shorts I, you know, around. get him some grass stain new balances and we have ourselves formula e's premier daddy he embodies that look perfectly and he's hitting podiums in a Nissan that was for the most part nowhere to be found last season so uh love the the props that the dad is giving yeah. to his team good lord man um I don't know if we're, if we're gonna get into into this um now or if we're doing it any later but uh the patience of this guy on that track for that last lap was was immaculate. It was the sneakiest move I have seen it forever. He was watching Jake Dennis and Pascal like duking it out, and as this literally the second that they went wide on that final turn, trying to like edge each other out, we had a three way drag race to the end, and of course, Ollie had the exact best line to just get the traction he needed and it was a one two three across the line in sequence almost yeah. it was like a it was like a scene from a movie where he just snuck his way in and it oh my god i you know historically i had always discredited ollie Rowland for um for being a little hot-headed and making really impulsive moves mostly because i think in my fantasy league he had consistently wrecked my drivers And so I just had a vendetta against him. Um, But he has completely remade himself in this new Nissan team and is showing up far, far more threatening than I think any of us imagined he would have. Two podiums in a row, like that might be a career first for him. Yeah, and if uh, if you were an Ollie Roland doubter until this race, go back and watch that clip. I don't have it prepped for this show. But he found just the tiniest little bit of opening on that final turn 
behind uh, Pascal.exe, who we're about to talk to in a second, and Jake Love Island Dennis. Uh, just slipped in, made sure he still had coverage on the track. Not all four wheels were off. And it, it was overshadowed by Sam Bird's finish and his pass in that last lap. But still, you got to give Matt props to Ollie Rowland and what he pulled off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like for, for an entire lap, I mean, if you were in his shoes, you were watching Jake Dennis and Pascal just bumping elbows the entire way. And you're just sitting there like, there's going to be a chance somewhere. And the patience for him to have just like laid in wait, just ready to keep that kid's head from bouncing against the corner table, you know? Like he <laughs> yeah, had yeah. he had that like that dad's perception where he was just ready to lurch out and prevent that catastrophe from happening and and coming out the hero. And it just shows. And coming out the hero. Exactly. Like wow, it was a uh, it was so fun to see and uh we need more um quality dad bod drivers <laughs> out in this world. And I feel like we'll get it. We're still the beginning part of the season. I think the the future is bright for Nissan. Uh, and I'm super excited about it because the the child, the boy man, uh, Sasha Fenestras, I just picked him up. So he didn't perform as well in Sao Paulo that I had hoped was out of the points. But still, Nissan and McLaren, uh, they're legit. We we know this. Yeah, he, he almost actually, he almost got himself right into that like final point position. Yeah. He just had the count the count in order to like. It's hard to get past the count. That is you know? that is very true. How big the banana? And oh, I do want to say because I was hoping so bad that we would have another banana soundbite on Team Radio, but as of recording this, we don't have that video yet. So. Um, if there is another banana bit uh, from the count, we'll be sure to talk about it in the next episode. But let's move on to Pascal, the non-human human racing driver. <laughs> we can see that the um, that the programming has been going pretty well. Pascal's been given uh, a neural link to DaCosta mirroring. <laughs> Yes, yes, indeed. And with uh, as many days as it's been since Diria, I can only imagine at Porsche, it, it's just been human training. And we see this in this photo up on the screen of just the, the mirroring. Uh, Antonio Felix da Costa, who we've dubbed Antonio Human da Costa, his job with Porsche this season isn't necessarily to win races. It's to train up Pascal on to be more human because the dude's a machine on the track, but off the track, you know, needs more of that personality interface. And so I think this photo, uh, it's a mirror. I think it's working. I think it's working really well for Pascal. I, yeah, I couldn't be happier to see um, Pascal learning to mirror maybe the most friendly driver on the grid. Um, only time will tell to see what kind of progress uh, comes forward of this. Um, we might be able to find a joke coming up pretty soon from him. Maybe he'll finally um, figure out what humor is. Uh, but until then, um, we're going to be watching and waiting, Pascal. What's up, you E-heads? It's that time of the show for you to get off of the racing line and into attack mode to give this show a boost. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like this episode and subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening on an audio platform, head on over to YouTube at Circuit Breakers Pod and do the very same thing. It gives us that algorithmic boost that really gets our wheels turning. So thank you. And back to the show. Moving on to practice. Uh, biggest takeaway, at least for me, was the RT. Dan Tictum, a perennial back of the pack uh, participant, he went fourth fastest oh. in FP1 in that ERT. And this just, this is ERT playing the games that they play. In one lap, they're actually competitive. When you go more than one lap, <laughs> game over. Yeah, you know, you mentioned this earlier to me uh, and that you think we might be the sole source of media coverage for ERT at this point. Um, and they're really not making it easy for us to cover things like, <laughs> ooh, fourth fastest in FP1. Danny, hey, there you are. Um, everyone else is just figuring out what the tire temps are and like what, what kind of you know degradation they're gonna have on hot surface danny's like this is this is it this is my this is my moment this 
free practice and sometimes qualifying, not in Sao Paulo, but free practice without a doubt is ERT's e <laughs> That's That's their big event. That's what they show up for. When the EPRI actually happens, it's like, hey, guys, just try and finish the race. Uh, and, and there's some uh, some developments that happened during this race that uh, didn't go in ERT's favor. But, um, yeah, I, I did say that, and I think it's true. I don't know, uh, you know, these back-of-the-pack teams, how much celebration they get. But I think that's why we're here. This is uh, what we're serving. If someone is watching and listening that's like ERT, they've been a Neo fan, you know, whatever, they're like, thank God someone's talking about them. And then we're kind of shitting on them. At least we're talking about them. All press is good that's press. This is the best we could do for you, Danny. We we want to see you push that push that thing a little further. Maybe next time, save that performance for an e -pre. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, let's move on from ERT's e -pre in free practice and talk about the quali round. Perhaps one of the craziest finishes in the duels, but before we got to that spot, Taylor, tell me about what was going on with the gun. Ooh, the gun had been given a 40 place grid penalty for changing his gearbox as well as his inverter. Each of those constitutes a 20 place grid penalty each, uh, which they just added together to create a 40 place grid penalty. Now, just to do some quick math here, there's uh, 22 drivers on the grid. Um, so they essentially, they essentially sat down and looked at Max and said, uh, how do we put him into grid debt? Um, like as if Formula E and the FIA was trying to give this German kid like 80 years of restitution to pay uh, following his involvement in World War II. But um, there, that was not the only story that happened in qualifying Dallas. Uh, there was maybe one of the closest final laps for pole position. Two thousandths of a second Dallas like I can't even provide an audible example of what two thousandths of a second is like yeah I can uh, just because I had to look it up two milliseconds for reference which is what the gap was between pascal.exe and Stoffel Van Dorn for pole position point zero zero two seconds is about the time it takes for a bolt of lightning to strike, or if you recall back last year when that submersible imploded, uh, it happened in about that same amount of time. So, so two, two of those, two, two Ocean Gate implosions. Near instantaneous, as humans perceive it, it damn near is instantaneous. And Pascal.exe edged out by that much time or that little time. Now, the one thing to bring up for a human's experience that is very quick, but if we want to talk about computing power, <laughs> for reference, a two gigahertz CPU in 0 .002 seconds can complete about four million cycles. So, I'm not going on record and accusing Pascal or Porsche of any sort of malfeasance with the race but you'd have to imagine because pascal took his final dual qualifying lap first and then shortly after stoffel's running behind him and that's where he was 0 0.002 seconds slower i think that that might have been at a disadvantage for ds penske and stoffel van dorn because pascal's computing power now goes back to a rest state and he can focus on the uplink to get into DS Penske's programming and potentially maybe do something digitally <laughs> with the car. Like he, you thought he was like doing a, Four, like a DDoS attack on the Penske, on the yeah. Penske's to pull out that uh, two thousandths of a second. Yeah, I I think it's it's feasible. I don't want to say damning accusations, but I think it's very feasible. <laughs> After your AI racer is done focusing on the race, there is a lot of processing oh, power that God. has to go somewhere. And I think it went to that DS Penske car. Yeah, because I mean, we have not even been provided uh, how many gigahertz of CPU power or like what output of RAM uh, they've installed in Pascal. You know, like with the algorithmic learning that he provides too, 
like for all we know, he could be, you know, bigger than China's super com computers. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, but he, maybe he's in his infancy. You know, like who knows where he's going to be two years from now? Like for all we know, he could be using the amount of computing power that the entire European continent provides. <laughs> yeah, just locking in, especially too, uh, because these cars are an extension of the power grid. Who's to say that they just put a little bit of <laughs> copper in the wheels so he can harness all that energy, <laughs> not to the car. It's not breaking the rules. Here's the thing about racing. You don't want to break the rules. You don't want to be like the gun and get a 40 place grid penalty for swapping out some parts. But there's no rules pertaining to artificial intelligence operating your car. So yeah. they kind of, they can do whatever they want until those changes are made. And here's this image of Pascal just going, Paul, there's no emotion here. It's just strictly business with this AI. And you know, maybe that's the next step for Formula E. Maybe um, for like Gen 5, uh, you drive over a section of the track and instead of getting you know, uh, an attack mode, you just get a DDoS attack on the next leading driver. Uh, you disrupt their <laughs> yeah. steering. Um, you know, really, really lean into the Mario Kart aspect of, uh, of what people see this racing series as. I could see it happening. Okay, one last thing before we actually get into uh, what went down on track during the race. And that's the pre-race. They had an interesting little spectacle. We've seen it in Formula One too with this Floatium. Uh, I have this uh, drop here. When you cross a Brazilian float with a podium, the answer obviously is a floatium. <laughs> so they just had this. Uh, it's it's a float yeah. in the middle of the track, and that's where they did the podium. Now, honestly, I thought uh, it was one of the coolest uh, podium spaces I've seen in a long time. Like that was, I thought that was incredible, um, and I was incredibly excited until you showed me the power unit that they provided for this gargantuan yes uh, so let me set the scene for you if you weren't aware watching the broadcast it was hot in sao paulo 90 degrees fahrenheit about what 32 degrees centigrade uh it was yeah. a hot one and i have this clip here from the pre-race and one thing you notice about this floatium is it is being driven by the feet of yeah. these race volunteers. Now, we don't have all of the details, but my assumption is, is that there might've been a little bit of a clash between Formula E and the event organizers in Sao Paulo because this float shouldn't be pushed by what, 20, 25 volunteers? But I think that they presented this float and they're like, hey, Formula E, wouldn't this be really cool if we put all the drivers on this float and went down the track? Like, that's a great idea. What's it propelled by? And they go, oh, we have, you know, a little little uh, four cylinder motor that, you know, putters it along at five miles an hour, 10 miles an hour. And they're like, nope, we're an electric league. No, you got to You got to get rid of it. It's like, well, we can't we can't take it out. OK, well, you got to find something else to propel it. And so they took the whole all the volunteers for this race. They gathered them pre-race. Like, hey, this is what's going to happen. These are the responsibilities. And then, oh, I need about 20 of you to come and just pull straws. No, no, no. I imagine that they looked for the strongest. They probably had auditions for this moment. Like with Formula E's background, they sat down and they said, let's get the beefiest of the grid out here for volunteers and and huck them out there i think they're they're signing up for just some illustrious like they get to pick up the cars like something really cool and memorable for a volunteer and they're like now you're pushing the float <laughs> fall in line yeah for the volunteer sign up sheet they ask how much uh they bench press <laughs> yeah. like as a as a fill in a fill in at the bottom of the sheet like and roughly how much would you say you could push. Have you ever played any professional sports? Like what level of athleticism would you uh, rate yourself on a scale of one to 10? Or it's probably the little smiley faces, like frowny to biggest <laughs> smile. Yeah, uh, yeah. Why don't you just circle the one that responds to um, physical activity? Uh, the other thing too that was noticed, uh, J.K. Penny Hughes, uh, other McLaren driver to race winner, Sam Bird. Uh, he was plucked out of the podium 
or the Floatium, uh, to give his take. And I just wanted to uh, play this clip and uh, talk about it a little bit because I... Uh, we need to do some dissecting as some Americans uh, as to what the hey penny was saying. Uh, let's give a look. We're going to speak to none other than Jake Hughes. He doesn't know we're about to do this, by the way. Jake, can I grab a quick word here? Yeah. My West Midland brother, how many times would we be on a Brazilian Flodium like this? Wow, in Wolverhampton and in Bromsgrove, <laughs> you probably don't see many of these. <laughs> uh, um... what? <laughs> what? Uh... Wow, in Wolverhampton and in Bromsgrove. <laughs> what did he say? I, um, Dallas, uh, I have no idea in the slightest. Now, we, we get a sense on what it's like to participate in these races, but we will never truly be in these driver's shoes knowing what they're going through pre-race. And I think he might have just been so juiced up, just ready to race that when he was, asked to give a take of what's it like being on a floatium well, all right jake uh go on get ready for the that's race right jake awesome fantastic uh i can't wait for that to be the poll quote um for for the next formula e newsletter uh for jake hey penny hughes um it feels like sometimes we don't even have to write the cockney into this man <laughs> no. um he just does it all his own um so eloquently like in this moment i do you like was he just in some sort of fever dream like is he just uh, like he's never felt 90 degree weather before in his life until now and do you think like he's just <laughs> falling apart at the at the seams like his, like his he is he drunk like what what is this i i have i figured out what blackout drunk people are saying easier than what this man just produced to like national audiences uh inter global international audiences. yeah global i don't think it's as extreme as experiencing 90 degree weather for the first time but definitely for the first time this year we're coming out of a long winter and being in that climate so soon i mean it's march uh, I, I think, yes, he is having a little bit of a mental collapse because it is so bloody hot. And we just... Wow, in Wolverhampton and in Bromsgrove? <laughs> Spare a hey, Betty, please. I, I think he's just... <laughs> just uh, the, the, the smile on. on his face as if, as if what he just produced was tangible. Um... Like it wasn't, like it wasn't, he just had his tongue removed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, do you know you? Now you talk. Like, I think I, <laughs> I think he was just struggling with the heat. Um, I think we'll get less of this gibberish um, as the season progresses, as we move, you know, throughout spring and in the summer. Uh, but this, I think, might be an early season gem when it's 90 slash 32 degrees out. Wow. In Wolverhampton and in Bromsgrove. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't even know that when it's hot out, isn't it? Is what happened in the bunker? Spare a hay petty, please. So Dallas, uh, I think that's enough of the pre-race, but I want to start getting into the race because there was so much to unpack for this. Uh, frankly, the races up to this point have felt a little formulaic in the way that they've played out. We've had some nice action on track, uh, but we have moved immediately back into that Peloton style of racing, which is sheer chaos for an hour straight. And I am on the edge of my seat every time I'm watching this. Um, I know that there's a lot of people that criticize like this point of racing. I think that it is a very different uh, style of racing than what we typically see. And there's certainly spaces for it to grow and evolve. Uh, but the proof is in it, the outcomes that it can provide as viewers, as spectators, and for this for the motorsport community, is incredible. Um, so let's go ahead and just look at what the podium turned out to be. Uh, we had divorced dad Sam Bird finally inching his way into getting custody of that race seat. After you know he's he's putting his bid in there. He's trying to really showcase um, that he is worthy of full custody of that race seat. Um, 
And he also managed to take McLaren's first ever win in Formula E. So you can only imagine that the entire Papaya squad is just is celebrating this and it will be celebrating this probably for the next three races before they start really pulling back into that spotlight. That's it's big for uh, for a team to get its first win. I do want to touch on this uh, Peloton style of racing. It is a different brand that you're watching because when the race had started, Pascal with his point zero zero two margin to get pole was off to the races and then pulled away. Normally, racing, right, it's an easy sport to follow. The car that crosses the line first at the end of the race is the winner. But with Formula E, it's a little different. It's like seeing Pascal pull away, you know, in the first part of the race. Uh, for someone that isn't familiar with, you know, these energy limitations of these cars, they're like, go, Pascal, go! But as someone who's watched these races for a few seasons now, it's like, where the fuck is he going? He's got to slow down. He's going to run out of juice. So exactly this. Yeah, this this brand of racing is is solely unique at this point for cars. Uh, we see it. Uh, it's a Peloton style racing because that's what bicyclists do, because they're conserving energy in their legs. And so, yeah, this was one of the greatest finishes I've ever watched. And I only have a few seasons under my belt, but I think anyone that has followed this series uh, for however long would say, yeah, this was one of the best finishes. Sam Bird pulls it out and he was getting multiple warnings uh, from his race engineer, Stephen Lane. Uh, you heard that on the radio during the broadcast of uh, cooling right side, cooling focus on the right cool it and uh well how did sam bird respond to it uh like he was um trembling i know there's a tremendous amount of focus and diligence that goes into uh piloting these vehicles around turns and into straights going you know upwards of 150 miles an hour um that was one of the highlights for me of race radio uh is to see sam bird trying to exhibit his i i understand um with especially i think he's he's just showing like how kind a personality he is um but he might have overdone it a little bit i think he made it very clear that he totally understands uh and maybe wasted a bit of breath on it. Um, the adrenaline was clearly surging through him during that point, and uh, yeah. But I I want to get into uh, Stephen Lay because I've been hearing more and more of him. Like he he has such a notable voice that stands out. There's something about him that sounds like he's like, um, like a bouncer outside of a London club who's just in Sam's ear, making making these calls like eyes forward us forward mate like there's a statham quality to it. <laughs> yeah. uh, like a like a clinical scrutiny uh but then there's these huge rewards and the bond between him and sam bird just seems so pure uh and the way that they communicate with each other that i was just elated by the way that this race played out and their ability to celebrate on that podium together was uh was a highlight of my watch for this whole season i'm sure will last all the way into the next yeah, and this is, you know, the epitome of, of how you win a race in Formula E. You edge all race long. You, you don't you don't let it bust. Not yet. And then on the final lap, you stroke that thing until you bring it home and you get the race win. The leader of the race for the up until the last two turns was Jaguars Mitch Evans and we talked about a previous episode I believe it was Diria that uh there's a little bit of a scuffle between nice guy Nick Cassidy and Mitch Evans for the favored Kiwi on this Jaguar team and I can't help to think that the radio messages that Sam Bird was receiving from Stephen Lane were a stark contrast to what Mitch Evans was receiving from his race engineer um nice guy nick crashed out of the race we'll get to that here shortly but i would like to think that mitch evans's radio updates uh going into that last lap wasn't strategy wasn't orders to you know um 
nurse the car one way or the other to get it, you know, hold on to that lead and finish the race and take on the take home the W. Uh, it was more just updates on what Nick Cassidy was doing once he got to the paddock of like, OK, Nick's uh, Nick's back in. Nick's getting water. Nothing, uh, nothing helpful. And you notice something post race, the interview with uh, team principal James Barkley when talking about uh, Jaguars finish or lack thereof. What was that about? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> it was it was one of those moments because I've been monitoring the optics of this very closely of like who's the favorite child in the family now and um i think especially with um james barkley uh he has a couple of slips every once in a while where like he is so clinical in the way that he's talking about the drivers but he spoke at lengths about how sad and disappointed he was and heartbroken he was about um nice guy nick's dnf um He maybe had like two or three words about how once again, Mitch Evans just blew it uh, on on the last lap. What kept them from a first place victory, he just kind of glossed over. Um, It was it was one of those moments where I'm just like, I think that the reality is coming clear is that Nick is the favorite in James Barkley's eyes and no matter how they're going to really spin it or talk about it, um, Mitch Evans' tendency to just disappoint at the <laughs> very last moment of his success uh, is going to consistently pop up um, as Nick manages to capitalize on the flawed successes of others. Um, yeah, it's a it's it's incredible. But the other thing that I felt very important and emboldened by. Um, was, you know, Sam Bird ultimately went through a divorce with Jaguar and Mitch Evans, right? Like he, in many ways, sacked uh, Jaguar's title championship for Mitch Evans last year and then had the balls to just show up and snatch away (laughs) Mitch Evans' first potential win for this whole season just right (laughs) on the last few turns uh, and ended his blue ball streak of victories uh, for a hundred for 980 days it, he has not won since 2021 i believe or 2022 that was his last first place finish um it was so good i mean the formula e unplugged literally had an entire episode uh featuring sam bird's uh descent into obscurity and he showed up and lit- and just swept it away from Mitch at, in, in the ways that Mitch does best which is throw it away when everything truly counts <laughs> but I think it's hard for us to talk about Jaguar without talking about nice guy Nick and his unfortunate DNF. I did notice watching the race replay there was a little bit of contact which is not out of the ordinary in this league there's always little bumps elbows getting pushed out but there was a little bit of contact on Nick's front end into Ito's behind and that was on lap five now if it's related or not by the time lap 16 came about uh, nice guy Nick this is what happened to him he comes up just his whole wing is underneath his tire and he is just Jesus take the wheel along for the ride loses a back tire I mean just, gnarly wreck and James Barkley's it, it, reaction it could have been it could have been much worse yes. like luckily I managed to pull at the exact right point I think back to Portland last year when this almost identical type of crash happened with um, with Nico Muller where he yeeted himself off the track like two three hundred yards uh into the barrier at like a hundred miles an hour and and it was actually a worrisome crash um i think that we need to talk a little bit about the gen 3 car and some of its specific design features mainly the front wings because these wings that they have designed for this series of car are overly fragile and i think it is a consistent thing that we have recognized these wings don't really do anything for the aerodynamic performance 
Uh, we have seen vehicles finish just as handedly without these front wings as with them. They historically um, had pretty durable wings and uh, that led to a lot of um, aggressive bump argy bargy style racing. Um, when they were designing the Gen 3, uh, they wanted to make these front wings more fragile as a way to um, disincentivize uh, contact for racing. And they might have gone a little too far in the other direction because these things feel like they're made of paper mache. Um, they have done nothing but actually cause more threatening wrecks in the way that the wings collapse and slide under their wheels. And on street tracks where you're going to have heavy barriers and lots of front to back contact because of the style of racing that there is, like there's a huge, huge, huge worry that exists because every time I see these front wings slip under those front wheels of a car, they just, it just looks like they're just skateboarding onto a path of destruction. Like, I remember maybe like 12 years ago, we found that one video of that little dog on a skateboard that is just cruising down the street behind its owner and, uh, and then just dumps straight into a recycling bin. And I have that image in my head every time I'm watching these things just slip straight into a barrier without control. I remember you remember this video clearer than anything because this is one of the <laughs> hardest things I have been able to pull up to make you laugh every single time. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to hold back my laughter. I got it queued up here. Uh, if you're listening, make sure to head over to YouTube and uh, give a look at uh, Nick Cassidy's crash through the perspective of a, uh, what is that, a Boston Terrier? Boston Terrier. <laughs> yeah. This is your first day of skateboarding here. <laughs> it's uh for me it's the um oh, it's the scream out. of of panic <laughs> yeah for me it's the scream of panic that uh comes from the owner's voice that rings through my head ah put it out like uh i can i can never avoid um hearing that every time i watch those things go straight into a barrier um, out of control. Um, oh, crying. And and frankly, and 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 frankly, that was not the only nose cone. That was not the only front wing that managed to uh, get annihilated during this race. I think we had like five or six front wings just ripped to shreds. We had Moeller's front wing um, just grinning like a hockey player's busted front teeth uh, throughout half the race. Just Every time they would cut to the vehicles on track, you're like, oh my God, what is that sound? And it's fucking Nico Moeller just <laughs> grinding that front that front wing to dust around the turns. Eventually, he goes in to pit. Um, in doing so also, we had um, our favorite uh, butcher of Formula E, so aptly named by Eduardo Mortara, uh, who claims, uh, once again, uh, the front wing of Norman Nato. Um, and Dallas, I don't know about you, but I feel like every single race I have seen in the past few years, Lucas Degrassi has claimed some piece of body work from someone. You know, so much so that I remember, uh, I think it was two or three years ago, two years ago maybe, um, when he and Edo were racing for Rocket Venturi Racing, um, I believe it was Monaco, uh, that he got dubbed the name The Butcher of Formula E by his teammate because... Degrassi made a move on Mortara during his incredible run, like took him out of the race by just cutting across his own teammate and destroying his front wing, annihilating him from points contention. Um, Mortara doubly named him the Butcher of Formula E. Uh, and I'm wondering, like maybe there's a t maybe there's a time for me to go through uh, Lucas Degrassi's entire Formula One career uh, to figure out what his uh, trophy room looks like of all of the pieces of bodywork he's claimed from his rival drivers. Like he's one of those uh, serial killers who just keeps a piece of his victims. 
But I, at the same time, I also wonder because there was so much debris on track consistently throughout this. I want to know what they're doing with that de debris. I don't know. Are they just feeding it to Nick DeVries after every race? Like, is that are like are they scooping it up and putting it in the pile for DeVries to to chomp down and convert back into raw scrap? Like. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I think uh, in the case of Degrassi, I think he has like those boys that uh, stand on the sides of tennis courts and run and grab the balls that go out of play. He has someone at apt that uh, runs and goes and grabs like Nato's wing and just make sure he gets it after the race. Yeah. What they do with the... Yeah, the Degrassi ball boys. <laughs> yes. That might be the name of the episode. Um, <laughs> Degrassi's ball boys. There it yeah. is. Um, but I there God. there is such a discrepancy into Formula E racing and just all the nudging, the bumping, the grinding. And then, yeah, the paper mache wings. It, it doesn't make any sense that... The, these drivers are getting turned into this Boston Terrier just along for the ride. Now, it could be Oliver Rowland's kids just wanted something to do during race. And so now they're just making the front wings uh, for replacements. Yeah. Uh, just a little arts and crafts project for them to work on. But it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me why they are so fragile, because I've experienced these cars firsthand in Portland last year. and turn one in that chicane on lap one immediately just clanging together just the noise you can hear it on tv for sure but when you hear it in person it's like oh this is this is like a heavyweight fight like, these cars are getting slammed yes. into each other yes so and then it's just the sound of grinding carbon fiber every time three cars pass for the next 15 20 races because it's just dangling off yep of their of their body work and um, i'm wondering if that like gen 3 evo is going to address some of this i have a sneaking suspicion it is going to address some of this just because i know a lot of the drivers and a lot of fans uh, universally have had complaints about this it's just it needs to be a more rigid in fact i think the cars might even perform better without these wings if you get a clean break from that thing like your speed might be increased you're not carrying that same weight and have less drag like for all we know because it, it's so minimal in what it's adding to the performance of the car like for all we know maybe the maybe the move is to just blow that wing off on the first lap and try to keep <laughs> yeah, it out of, uh, out of your tires and then just be a be a dart be a missile throughout the rest of the race i don't know um but i know that throughout this race it did not go well for just about anyone um but with that, we did have a couple of DNFs aside from Nick Cassidy. We Our did. good guy Nick was the only real DNF, but I'm wondering which diarrhea no finishes we had this week. Because uh, we only really had two quiet DNFs. And um, Dallas, why don't you lead us into a couple of these? Yeah, and we should preface it to the diarrhea no finish is a circuit breakers original of drivers that retire themselves, not necessarily the car because their bowels have uh, taken over and they just can't handle the race anymore. We saw it uh, first officially in Deria with uh, Jehan Daruvala, the rookie, just not being able to 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 handle, you know, being on that field, you know, first double header of his Formula E career. But yeah, Muller and then J.K. Penny Hughes, uh, very late in race. And he unofficially got the diarrhea, no finish, or he did finish, never mind. He had diarrhea, we were suspecting, in Mexico because he blacked out a little bit, you know. Wow, in uh, and in Screen Rome. went black, but he finished the race. Um, but in Sao Paulo, in this race, uh, second to last lap uh, pulled in and just hit the pits. Now he was in P20 at that point, so he was completely out of the points. Uh, but we made the decision in Diria to just award Jayon Deruvula with the diarrhea no finish. We want to open up Sao Paulo to a poll on of these two drivers, Nico Muller and Jake Haypenny Hughes. Who do you think 
was the diarrhea no finish of this race. Now this poll is gonna be up on our Instagram, uh, on the Instagram stories at Circuit Breakers Pod, as well as the communities tab on YouTube, same handle, at Circuit Breakers Pod. Go ahead and cast your vote, and by the time uh, Tokyo rolls around, uh, we will have an answer of who gets the diarrhea no finish for Sao Paulo. Taylor, who's your money on? Uh, you know, honestly, I think that uh, J.K. Petty's Hughes uh, might have been struggling with uh, dehydration throughout the entirety of his time. The delirious nature of <laughs> his inability to talk. I don't know if he just brought cholera with him through his um, London slums. He's been drinking the wrong water and he brought it all the way to Sao Paulo and that's why he's so delirious. Um, but my bet is on J.K. Penny Hughes uh, based on his uh, actions prior to this that he just needed to pull into the pits before he lost consciousness after voiding his bowels uh, entering into the final few laps. Um, Dallas, how about you? My money is on Mueller. Looking in his mirrors and seeing the front of the grid just ruff, 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 ruff. he's just oh fuck just trying to drive out of that and I think that activated a stint of irritable bowel syndrome that he just had to pull in uh, but no don't let yeah. my words or Taylor's words swing you one way or the other cast your vote and we'll have our diary and no finish uh, come Tokyo uh, for Sao Paulo. Before we close out, um, last week we've been doing a recurring segment with um, the ERT Energy Conservation Clause. Oh, yes. Um, uh, for the first time, the ERT boys managed to completely drain their balls on track. Uh, unfortunately, it did not result in anything uh, of value. You know, I think since they lost their title sponsor in NEO, um, they have been saving every kilowatt hour of energy to try to cut costs for the race. And maybe that has been one of the strategies they've been implementing is how to stay on the grid in general. Um, but today they absolutely splurged everywhere they could. Um, in fact, more so than they were even allowed to because in his home race, Sergio Sede Camara was disqualified from the race because his car went over the maximum amount of battery required to finish the race. And if that is not just an absolute slap to that team, I don't know what is because it, it hurts me to witness uh, just how hard it is for ERT to figure out any sort of race strategy for their drivers to remain competitive. I'll say this about Sergio set to camera. It's not his fault. He's in a shitty car. Times are tough. The budget's tough. Just stick to what we discussed earlier. The free practices and sometimes qualifying is ERT's e -pre. Um, But you got to finish the race. Even if it's just lifting and coasting more than the other drivers. Danny Boy did it. And he did splurge. Uh, you know, you had predicted, I asked you after the Deria races, hey, how how much energy do you think ERT is going to finish Sao Paulo with? And you're like, I'm going to say like 5%. And I went back and looked at it and I'm like, they were right at, you know, zero crossing the line in negative for set to camera. But for, <laughs> for set to camera, yeah. But for Dan Tictum, it's like, look at Danny Boy, 0. 0.4, 0. 0.3, 0. 0.2. <gasps> he did it. <gasps> he did it. He finally did it. So, oh my God. I'll continue saying it. Uh, we'll continue covering ERT. I'll continue apologizing for ERT so long as I own Neo stock, even though they're not associated with the team anymore. Um, but you're right. They have to do better in a race. You, you can't. I've. I've never seen that happen. Now, I know that in races when, you know, the cars are allotted so much energy, but it's not like they're just going to be, you know, stuck on the side of the road. They can't even move the car anymore. Like they ran completely out of juice. There's still some left in there for logistics, get back to the pits, all that. Yeah. But I've never seen it where a driver goes over that allocation before crossing the line. And so it's just one of those like cardinal no-nos in Formula E, I feel like. It's like, just don't do that. 
Like, yes, yeah, you're not going right. to have good placement, right. but at least get over the line and not have to dip into the reserve energy that you're not allowed to use. It's just, it's a tough one. It's tough. What do you think ERT is going to be sitting at at the end of the <laughs> Tokyo e Is this a, another uh, bit that we're going to start doing is what ERT's energy levels are going to be? Uh, okay. With... Yeah. With a new track, and I'm going to pull up the same thing that uh, we did with Sao Paulo and doing the preview. I want to see this track so I can make uh, somewhat of an educated guess having no previous information on this race since it is brand new. Um, it only spans like a block and a half. That's a small That's one. a teeny yep. tiny one. Okay. ERT. I'm going to go the opposite direction. They didn't have enough juice, or Sergio said to camera didn't have enough juice to finish Sao Paulo. Dan Tictum barely did. He did what you're supposed to do, you know, cross the line at zero. I'm going to say because it is so technical, there's not going to be, you know, this, um, this hole punched in the air for the slipstream and drivers taking chances. Everyone falls in line with the Peloton style. This is going to be, hey, whoever can survive. Uh, all the corners the quickest ERT is not going to be the quickest in the race we know that I'm going to go like 6-7% for ERT o on average I'll say for both of them for both of, for them, both of them you're doing an average or uh, both of them combined I'll do an average an average of 7 okay I am going to err a little more on the low end and I'm going to say an average of 2% remaining on this I think that this will probably be somewhat of an energy thirsty race and that it's a lot of breaking zones and acceleration zones so I'm thinking 2% for the ERT boys uh, remainder averaged well lock it in 2.5% 2.5% lock that one in and we're doing prices right rules so Fuck you. <laughs> After I said my number. <laughs> All right, we'll do closest to pin. All right, we'll do closest okay. to pin. I'll give it to you. Uh, but yeah, there you have it for the ERT predictions. Um, I mean, I think I can go on record and confidently say uh, the podcast with the most ERT coverage in the world. Now, to wrap up this episode, I, I want to to talk to you the viewer and listener about this grid preview episode that exists we have it but we decided not to put it out and the reason why i'm bringing this up is because a lot of these jokes of the nicknames of drivers or whoever kind of seems like it came out of nowhere for taylor and myself we've been running with this since we recorded that episode but they're the level of quality that that episode came out with, we weren't entirely happy with. So what we're going to be doing is coming out with a redux of that episode. Now it'll be brand new to you, uh, but we want to run through that entire grid, kind of establish not only the drivers and the teams for a fan of Formula E, but also as kind of a piece, uh, companion piece uh, to follow along with this show. Um, so when we're talking about Pascal being an AI, there's a little bit more of, you know, uh, an establishment to it. So look out for yeah. that episode between now and Tokyo. And speaking of Tokyo, looking ahead to that, it's the first time the E-Circus goes to Tokyo. Taylor, what are uh, your expectations on this race? Oh, my God. I am, uh, I'm frankly so excited for this. This has been one of those races that has been talked about for, I think, like four or five years without um, a lot of progress or headway. And so seeing this on the calendar, um, especially as so many other races have dropped off, the one-off races that we all really, really adored. I'm thinking back to like Cape Town. I'm thinking back to, um, to Korea. Um, and... I think that this is one that they really need to make stick. Um, from what I've been seeing, it's a very, very um, technical street circuit. It is not going to be the same as Sao Paulo. Um, I think that there's certain drivers that really excel on that, certain vehicles uh, in the grid that really excel, or excel at that. Um, I'm looking to 
really try to get Robin Fiennes uh, redeemed in this scenario because I think he is such an incredible technical driver that I am uh, hoping that he manages to master uh, the challenges of this circuit and what they really offer um, historically. Uh, Dallas, what about you? What are you looking forward to in this? Well, the fact that it is the first ever, uh, just throwing every single driver, doesn't matter if they're a rookie like Daruvula or they've been in it since day one, like Lucas Degrassi and hunting for heads. I'm sure he'll get some heads in Tokyo as well. It's brand new to everyone. So even just injecting more of that unpredictability that this series is known for, having it in to Tokyo and I looked it up on the event info on the Formula E website. They're actually going to have like a uh, like a Pokemon crossover collab uh, in the fan village. <laughs> so, you know, officially licensed Pokemon oh with God. Formula E. So the league itself is making some big moves, really embodying the Japanese culture, one of the most famous yeah. exports from Japan. So um, obviously not being at the race, I won't get to experience I that. I cannot wait to see them Photoshop Sebastian Buemi on a Team Rocket costume. <laughs> yeah. You know what? <laughs> Jesse. James. <laughs> Banana. Uh, the, here's another impromptu thing. This was not planned. Um, so in addition to the diarrhea, no finish, uh, let us know what drivers you think uh, the Pokemon equivalent is. And this is something, Taylor, that you and I will have to think about, too, and assign Pokemons yeah. to, to each driver and, uh, and the similarities between the two. I just got really excited. Uh, so we'll do that as well. <laughs> Let's. Yeah, we got to make it. We got to make a grid equivalent uh, of, of Pokemon. So um, I think the best uh, Pokemon reference to a driver uh, we will feature on the show and give you a shout out. Um, but we will do some review on those uh, coming up here. Hey, thanks so much for watching and listening. If you want to connect with us on the socials, uh, YouTube and Instagram at Circuit Breakers Pod, Twitter at Talk Formula E, and shout out to It's Tricky for a banger of an intro and theme song for the show. Check them out on SoundCloud. The links will be in the show notes on audio and in the description on YouTube. Taylor, any uh, any closing thoughts? Oh, man, I'm just looking forward to the next couple races. Uh, we got coming up Dallas uh, where we get to just sit down and blow out as much as we can of this uh, crazy circus. I'm ready to edge and blow out just like Sam Bird and the rest of the grid. All right, see you next time. Mm -hmm.